Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Greg Wilson back. He last, most recently gave a talk on postcards that were wonderful fun. He graduated from the University of Delaware a few years ago. He joined the Air Force National Guard, and then he went to library school on a full scholarship that had one requirement. He had to work in a rural library for two years, and his first assignment was to the State Library of Delaware, located in Dover. Yes. Which is no longer rural, but maybe, no. maybe it was at some point. His first interest in the birth of the teddy bear began in 1968, when Greg was appointed curator of the Theodore Roosevelt Collection at Harvard University. We learn something new every day. Who knew Harvard had the Roosevelt Collection? He received that position when he saw in a small room that the collection was in disarray. He wrote a grant proposal that paid for his salary for two years and archival materials to properly house books, photographs, postcards, political buttons, and so on. One of the dingy boxes had a label, Teddy Bears, and it contained all sorts of different materials related to, of course, our favorite, favorite teddy bear. In 1972, Greg moved on to Franconia College in New Hampshire, where he stayed until 1976 when he came to Northampton to become the five college librarian. He's written a few articles on teddy bears and when he came to Amherst he met Tom Carhart from, and together they planned the first teddy bear rally which was held on the Amherst Town Common. And does that continue? No. No, no, no. no. It's it's not. It ran for a good run but then it petered out. Uh, with this crowd, I think you may want to reinvigorate it. But anyway, he's going to okay. talk today on the history of teddy bears. Welcome. And thank thank you. you all for coming. This is a great turnout. Uh, I'm sure all of you know the teddy bear was named after Theodore Roosevelt. But I do want to talk a little bit about Roosevelt to give you a background of why the teddy bear was born. That's the point of today's talk. But first I want you to know a few facts. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was the first to drive a car. He was the first to fly in an airplane. The airplane was built by the Wright brothers and it was 1910 that he did that, five years after the airplane. It was a pretty uh, uh, primitive airplane for sure. Roosevelt was, notice I'm not saying TR, he didn't like that nickname. Uh, Roosevelt was the first to submerge in a submarine. He was the first to leave the country while still in office as president. Now here's the one that I like to tell people the most. He was the most intellectual of all our presidents. Tell me Thomas Jefferson was better? No. Roosevelt wrote 28 books on a wide variety of subjects. His first was the <clears throat> Naval War of 1812, which he wrote as a senior thesis and then expanded it into a book that's still used by the Naval <coughs> Academy because of its historic accuracy. You know, another thing he did, he would read an average of two books a day. He was a prolific reader, and he loved to talk about books. <laughs> Theodore created the National Wildlife Refuge. He created the National Forest System. He created the Food and Drug System, uh, administration, 18 national monuments, five national parks, 51 refuges. He was the first to appoint a Jewish person to a cabinet post, Oscar Strauss, to the Labor Department. By the way, he created the Labor Department. <laughs> and he was, and here comes the story for t uh, today, to invite a black person to a social occasion at the White House, Booker T. Washington, and he was also the first to have a toy named after him, 
the teddy bear. <laughs> this is an old one. I would say 70 year, 75 years old because it was my teddy bear. <laughs> he is not going to uh, uh, be passed around. <laughs> now, <clears throat> how did it happen that a that the teddy bear got his name? Well, Roosevelt was a he was a wonderful supporter of black rights and rights for women also. He wanted to assure his nominee, he became president in 1901 at the assassination of uh, William McKinley and his burning desire was to be elected president in 1904. However, he had one problem. He was doing so much positive work for the country to make it beautiful with the national parks and the wildlife refuges, et cetera, and for the rights of women. And for, he was the first, not as president, but as police commissioner of New York to point a woman to the New York police force. Uh, so he really was a very progressive guy. And <clears throat> he wanted to make sure that he could be nominated. And he knew to do that, he had to win the South. The South was very conservative and very backward in many ways. But he said, I'm going to make a trip through the Southern states, the first Republican to do that. They weren't welcome there. As a matter of fact, when it was announced he was going to do this, a local newspaper in Mississippi ran an ad that said wanted 15 years to sleep with the president when he comes for our trip. However, when he went to the South on these trips, on this trip, uh, thousands of people came out to see him. They filled the auditoriums. Now you would think this was a little unusual because every time he spoke, he said, I'm making it clear to the people here that I am not going to allow the Jim Crow laws to exist where I can stop them. He said, I <clears throat> fully intend to appoint blacks to federal posts. And that shut down the audiences where there were thousands of people uh, listening to him speak from the back of trains and in auditoriums. But he said, you know, you can't find fault with this policy because my mother was a great southerner. My mother's brother was head of your secret service in the Confederacy during the Civil War. And she used to dress me up uh, as a little child and hide things under my, <coughs> under my clothes and meet the, pe the blockade runners to take medicine and money to the South. And that got thunderous applause. And then he said again, I am not going to allow the disfranchisement of uh, rights for blacks. Well, part of what he loved to do was to hunt. Everybody knows that he was a big hunter. That's usually the uh, one thing people think they knew about Roosevelt. Uh, the curious thing is in 1902, which is pretty early, that was before his African trips, et cetera, et cetera, he <clears throat> said it's more important to hunt with a camera than a rifle. That's because we have to preserve our natural resources. More important to hunt with a camera. People don't have that uh, concept of Theodore. Well, he did go on the, uh, through the South and there was a hunting trip that was set up and 
it happened November 15, 1902. Now what happened was Hope Kyer was the guide for the hunting trip and <clears throat> he took, there was uh, two members of the press, uh, five or six southern liberal Democrat and Republicans that went on the hunting trip and for two days they didn't get any bear. He want, Roosevelt said he wanted to go on a bear hunt in uh, Mississippi in the, really the wilderness area. So he went and they didn't get a bear. So Holt Kyer, the guide, said, come with me. And he took him way out from where they were camping and <clears throat> they, uh, they uh, took him out to camp and he couldn't get a bear. And at the end of the day, the guide said, stay here with and don't move. And about two hours later, this is all reported in the New York Times, about two hours later he brought a 300 pound bear. Everybody thinks the story was a little cub bear, but it wasn't. It was a big 300 pound bear that uh, was really uh, lame, sick, old, and said, here, Mr. President, shoot this bear. Roosevelt said, that would be the most unmanly thing I can imagine. And they pulled the bear back into where the hunting camp and all the reporters and other uh, Mississippi politicians were sitting around drinking their coffee and whiskey, I should imagine, and said, <clears throat> oh, you've got a bear, shoot him, shoot him. And Roosevelt turned to uh, a fellow named McEnany, who became governor of Mississippi a few years later, and said, dispatch that bear with your knife. And he took a knife and killed him. Well, the New York Times uh, made a cartoon in the Washington Post. I said New York Times, I mean the Washington Post, Clifford Berryman, made this cartoon called Drawing the Line in Mississippi. Well, the line referred to the color line and it shows Roosevelt saying no to shooting this little bear. And what essentially happened was uh, lots of people saw that cartoon. Morris Mitchum who had a candy store in New York, Brooklyn, looked at that cartoon and said, I'm going to make a little bear and call it Teddy's Bear. And he did that and put it in his candy store. In his candy store, of all things. And people went ballistic. They wanted that bear. And he started making uh, the bears with his wife and he sold uh, that Christmas 1902, lots of bears. Now, a lot of people think it was the Stife Company that made the first teddy bear, but in fact, they didn't. They didn't bring bears to America until 1903, <clears throat> and that's based on the toy catalog, the wholesale catalog for uh, they didn't have toy stores in those days, but they had department stores. And the Stife Bear was brought here in 1903. Uh, but they still like to claim that they were the originators of the teddy bear. They were not. Now, instantly, the teddy bear became a very popular item. It became the first national fad in America, popular cultural fad. Uh, within, uh, by the way, Morris Mitchum in 1903 formed the Ideal Toy Company, which still exists, 
they became um, more famous for their eye, uh, Barbie doll than for their teddy bears. And I have to reluctantly say that their bears are uh, probably better made and better looking and more enjoyable as a bear. But instantly, you remember a year ago I was here and I talked about postcards? Well, here's some postcards that I'll pass around for you to see. Uh, this particular postcard uh, says the Dawes wanted Teddy Roosevelt to not run a third term, that would be 1912, because they wanted to come back into popularity with children rather than be, yeah, so the teddy bears will have a chance again. So don't run, Teddy. Uh, this is from, it's a leather postcard, and it's from 1903. So you can see, a year, one year after uh, Roosevelt made this trip and uh, the first teddy bear was made. And here's another leather postcard. Pass that around. These are sample. I cataloged 500 different Teddy Roosevelt cards, and I don't remember, since that was many years ago, 1968, 69, uh, how many teddy bear cards there were. But I assure you, there are lots and lots. I asked all of the living children of Theodore whether they had a teddy bear, and not one of them said they did. <laughs> I was on eBay last night, or a couple nights ago, looking at um, just Roosevelt memorabilia, and there was this postcard of Roosevelt sitting with a bear teddy bear, of course, and I said to myself, that's not right. That, that, it doesn't make sense because the children never had teddy bears and he wouldn't have sat with a bear. So I emailed the fellow and said, I see you have a postcard of Roosevelt sitting with a teddy bear. Uh, what, what's, what, tell me something about it. I was unaware this was a possibility. Well, he said, uh, I'm out of town now. I'm sorry I can't be bothered talking to you. <laughs> that sort of... Uh, <clears throat> Some people like to say that uh, Roosevelt was not in favor of blacks, that he wanted to uh, uh, not allow them to have equal rights. Uh, here's something that is what the Republicans did. The Republicans, this was the election of 1912. They wanted Taft to become uh, run again. And they said, remember Brownsville. Well, I went to uh, Brimfield and found this in a, a collector. He actually specialized in presidential buttons. And I said, oh, that Brownsville is interesting. What do you want for that? And he said, I don't know. It's just a bunch of colored people. And I said, yeah, it is, you know. <laughs> well, I said, what do you want for it? Take a dollar? And he said, oh, you can have it for a quarter. I said, fine. <laughs> he said, I got three more. I said, do you want to sell three more? And he said, not particularly. And I said, well, uh, I want three more. And he said, you can't have them. He said, you know what it's all about, don't you? And I said, I do. Well, what happened was in 1907, a bunch of black soldiers stationed in Texas uh, went into town one night and two of the men shot but didn't kill the bartender and made a raucous. And there was a national outcry about this because these soldiers were put in jail. 
Theodore Roosevelt said, I want the guilty people to come forth. That was an unmanly thing to do. And <clears throat> they wouldn't come forward. And he, then he said, sent notice to the regiment and said, I want somebody in the regiment to tell us who are the guilty ones, and none of them did. Well, Roosevelt said, then you're all dishonorably discharged. And that was, it was in Brownsville, Texas. Well, the Republicans try to use that against Roosevelt to say he was against blacks and all good blacks should vote against Roosevelt. Uh, well, let's see, what's it say here? Discharged without honor. Uh, one of the Bushes uh, later, and all the men were, had passed away, of course, made the regiment have an honorable discharge and changed it. Well, that had nothing to do, the top one is a teddy bear, which was a common political token of the time. Uh, and here's another that would have been put on children's clothing. Well, Roosevelt was a military man. Remember, he won the Medal of Honor, uh, and he won it because he, at the Spanish-American War, uh, he worked very hard to get the people home from uh, the, uh, the country where they were, Cuba, where they were fighting because they were uh, dying of disease. And he was, uh, he did everything he could for the veterans, the so-called Rough Riders and other uh, veterans. A very curious thing happened in 1908 <clears throat> uh, when the, uh, Teddy was going to leave the office. He handpicked William Taft. He later was against Taft because Taft did away with all of his progressive uh, movements. But Taft saw, seeing the popularity of the teddy bear, said, I'm going to pick out something. And his campaign advisors made a very curious choice. The teddy bear, as you can see here, is just very lovable, you know? This is my childhood bear, and uh, he's not going anywhere. Maybe even to my coffin or cremation <laughs> or whatever. But Taft curiously picked out a possum. <laughs> yeah, of all the silly things. And this is actually really, this is the proof of it, Billy Possum. Well, Taft was their fattest president, as yeah. many of you know, um, and, uh, and <clears throat> he lost, of course. <laughs> uh, president Wilson won in 1912 uh, because it was just not going to elect a possum and we're not going to elect Teddy Roosevelt again. Uh, just as a curiosity, again, not a teddy bear, but it's a uh, children's clothing buttons from Roosevelt's 1910 uh, African safari. The one thing to remember about Roosevelt and his collecting uh, animals was that he sent them all back to Harvard Natural History Museum and to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, which his father created with a few other wealthy uh, individuals. Uh, and Theodore Roosevelt continued to send uh, specimens that he would personally uh, prepare, uh, get the taxidermists to make them into uh, museum quality specimens. Uh, 
the interest in teddy bears just never waned. And in 1986, Tom Carhart came to me when I was with the five colleges and said, I've just come back from England where there's a teddy bear rally. Do you think we could do something like that? And, yeah. Here in Amherst. And his wife made these posters for the rally. Ann Chatney, Tom Carhart, a fellow from the bookstore in the center of town, the stationery. Those, by the way, those two posters I'm donating to your historical society. Uh, yeah. We have to say that for each year there were a different number of bears. The first poster had one bear, the second poster had two bears, and this one, as you can see, is one, two, three, four, uh, the ninth one. One, two, three, four, the ninth because they had nine beers. I think we need to do teddy bear picnics on the front lawn. Yeah. Wouldn't it be fair? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it was very well planned out. Uh, I can't really uh, believe how nice everything went. The thing is, we met for about six months, uh, that long. We met in the winter and then through the winter into the spring. We had no idea whether this was going to be of any interest or work. We, th we kept saying, well, maybe a couple hundred people will come. Uh, who knows? 10,000 people came to Amherst for the teddy bear rally. It was incredible. We just had no idea. And for several years after that, it was the same. There was just this big, really big interest in teddy bears. Uh, soon after that, there were several other rallies that happened. One was in Bristol, Connecticut. But the interest in teddy bears has uh, lost its association with black history, uh, but it does continue. And one thing that I find troublesome is that, oh, somewhere in the eight, 70s, eight, more like the 1980s, uh, the teddy bears became too frilly in my mind. I liked the traditional old-fashioned teddy bear. Uh, people began dressing them up in silly ways and uh, a lot of those came to the Amherst Common in 1986 and thereafter, uh, and they were expensive. And then people started to say, oh, because it's, uh, we made some in 86, uh, by 87 we had to get $200 for them. I thought it was a little, little crazy. But one, one bear, I don't collect bears. <coughs> But one I did get was uh, in 1986, I'll pass that around. This, he doesn't go around. You can't touch him. Uh, in 1986, uh, they made an aircraft carrier, the USS Roosevelt, after Theodore. And uh, my wife and I were invited to the commissioning of that. And that was one of the uh, table uh, huh. presents one got. Uh, I think I've already exceeded my time. <laughs>